Hello, uh, my name is Jason Arde and today we're going to have a keynote lecture on engaging in race and racism in terms of talking about it pedagogically within higher education. Um, one of the things I think is really important about kind of doing this is just engaging in terms of thinking about what some of the problems are and I suppose the thing for me that's kind of really interesting in terms of thinking about some of these issues are how people experience them. Um, particularly in the learning space and in the classroom space, so what that looks like. So for me, as someone that was a PE teacher and has taught kind of school kids and then gone and taught school kids in further education and then gone into higher education, one of the things that I always thought was interesting is how you create the learning space and how you take into that learning space intersectionally different approaches. So for example, how people with disability may engage with certain things or how people um, from particular ethnic backgrounds or class backgrounds or from particular um, sexuality backgrounds, how they undertake or engage with different types of discourse. So for me this becomes a really interesting thing because as an autistic person um, I learn in a particular way and so I became quite fixated with how people engage in pedagogical spaces and more importantly what things people may do to omit people from those spaces. One of the things that I think is kind of really interesting is this kind of dynamic around an inclusive curriculum. So I suppose what we're going to kind of think about today or just kind of touch on are some of the things around what is an inclusive curriculum and how does it actually work in, in practice. I suppose when we're kind of thinking of inclusivity generally speaking, we are looking at it through an intersectional lens. So we are thinking about all students. I guess the kind of interesting thing with this context is that we know that that kind of context is used in different ways. It's kind of manipulated in different ways. And I think one of the things that is really, really important is really thinking about what does the term inclusive mean? So effectively, this idea of an inclusive curriculum aims to improve the experience, skills and attainment of all students, including those in protected characteristic groups, by ensuring that all students, regardless of background, are able to fully participate and achieve equal rates. So what we do know are that certain groups of protected students, in terms of kind of minority groups, are not getting those same outcomes. And that is problematic. And it sounds like an obvious thing to say, but the problem is, is that the issue has been brought to the fore several times, but there has been, over the last 25 years, a really slow response to engaging with the fact that particular minority groups have certain experiences within higher education that are completely inequitable. And so one of the ways in kind of, I guess, levelling this inequity is really through kind of going back to, you know, central tenets of what makes, what fundamentally structures a curriculum. So what does that look like? You know, does it represent seeing yourself in the curriculum? Does it go beyond that? Is it about having a space of belonging? Is it about feeling included within the curriculum that you engage with on a daily basis? There are certain kind of things that would be really interesting to unpick because it's not a kind of one issue problem. There are so many kind of tenets to that problem and it's thinking about how we kind of shift the dynamic and more importantly, move towards something that I guess engages and embraces the idea of collective responsibility because I think there is an onus sometimes on one group of people to solve that problem. So historically, if we talk about issues regarding black, Asian and minority ethnic students and staff, it's always situated with those individuals having to lift that burden themselves, even though they never asked to be in a position like that in the first place. And probably more importantly than that, the burden lifters, the labour carriers, are often, if not almost all the time, women of colour. So I think that's quite an important thing to acknowledge because that has great implications for how people engage with these particular discourses. So I suppose some of the areas for consideration are going to kind of just kind of interchangeably be around decolonising the curriculum, intersectionality, you know, centering discussions around race and racism. So I think one of the things that's kind of really interesting is uncomfortable spaces and how people define an uncomfortable space. In theory, or no, not in theory, in practice, I don't really think there should be anything such as an uncomfortable space. I think that people should be able to speak their truths and I think if it's managed and facilitated in the right way, there's no reason why that can't be an open discourse. But for some reason, there is a censorship that happens in classroom spaces and there is a victimisation that occurs that marginalises particular individuals. So for example, if we talk about an issue around gender equality, for example, um, and it's in a room that's a room predominantly full of men, how do we centre that discourse? How do we 
engage young men in a conversation about gender inequality, as an example, which doesn't position them as thinking that they're being victimised. And actually, the whole point is to provide a broader discourse about the discussion around gender. Likewise, when we're talking about race and racism, is that whole feeling of people feeling as though, actually, well, how does this relate to what we're doing? Um, but for the person of colour that resides in that inequitable space, being able to have their life experience or their lived experiences discussed in a topical, um, inclusive and analytical way is also a way of gaining self-affirmation from being in a space that, if I'm being honest, uh, people pay a subscription to. They belong in this space and it's really important that they kind of really feel as though they can centre those discussions without fear of judgement. Um, and again, yes, of course, there are people who may not know how to engage and in particular ways, but that comes down to, I guess, the educator, the facilitator, creating a space where people feel as though they can speak and where language where needed has to be corrected. Because I think fundamentally, one of the things that's really interesting about these kind of different contexts is that they all fundamentally prepare students to take their place within society. So we live in a diverse, hyper-diverse, multicultural society. And one of the things that I think is really, really important around that is providing people with a toolkit to navigate that society in the world of work. And increasingly, for whatever reason, we seem to be digressing in that area. And you can kind of make a direct correlation between political correctness being a thing, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, and now free speech almost being weaponized to demonize particular intersectional groups. So in terms of kind of thinking about, I suppose, and kind of really centering this around race and racism, we're kind of thinking about anti-racist education and the potential it holds. So for me, you know, when you think about ideas around anti-racist education or kind of liberatory education, just generally speaking, its potential is really kind of truly reflects the cultural hybridity that we have. OK, so it's this idea of telling life histories in a particular way. So if we think about what kind of histories occupy the canon, a lot of them are white, dominant Eurocentric histories. And those histories do not take into consideration aspects of the global um, South, of indigenous populations. It doesn't consider all of those types of different contexts. And that becomes really, really pivotal when students are trying to develop a sense of belonging. Because I think one of the things that gets completely separated is this idea that at 18, in most cases, but let's just say, you know, if learning is a lifelong journey, we could talk about students that are coming at 18, or we could talk about mature um, students. There is that idea of trying to develop a sense of identity, you know, whether it's through studying, whether it's through learning, through knowledge interaction, or knowledge exchange, or knowledge construction. And if we have effectively education that doesn't engage those people in that way, we are doing them a disservice. And the disservice happens because fundamentally we're preferring one particular context of knowledge and suggesting that that is the knowledge and that the other things that go in and around that do not exist. And that's what we're doing by kind of marginalising that knowledge. I think the centrality of whiteness as a construct and whiteness is aligned to power and privilege means that in terms of disrupting that canon, it becomes very, very difficult. It becomes really difficult and it becomes difficult because it's not necessarily white people. It's very important to make that distinction. Whiteness as a, as, as a construct, just sen it centers around power and privilege. So if you have people who may occupy particular types of power and privilege, as I may occupy unfairly as a, as a male um, or as a black male, then it's going to cause problems in terms of decentering that. So trying to decenter that power and privilege, trying to decenter that whiteness, means making space for other bodies of knowledge to be accepted and to be acknowledged in the same way. And effectively what we have in the academy is a system that almost facilitates that power and privilege. It doesn't actually do a lot to decenter it or dismantle it. Now that isn't a criticism of anyone, but that is just a fact. You know, whiteness, the centrality of whiteness is all encompassing and it very much still defines a lot of what we do in our learning, teaching and university spaces. I think the monopoly and the proliferation of kind of dominant white European canons 
it compromises all our curriculum. You know, if we think through kind of STEM, if we think through kind of things around English literature, if we think through things around um, engaging in social sciences, human sciences, a lot of it is centered around kind of dominant white philosophies. And I think one of the things that becomes really important is this idea of where do black, Asian and minority ethnic learners in the classroom space, how do they then conceptualize other people that have contributed to the canon? How do they develop that knowledge that in essence is supposed to equip them to undertake their place in the world of work? So by kind of learning or facilitating these kinds of, kind, these kinds of pedagogical outlooks, we are kind of facilitating in many respects we're, we're disadvantaging students. We're not preparing them for the world of work. We're not preparing them to adequately take their place within society. And that is problematic. So it goes more beyond just, you know, okay, decolonizing the curriculum or changing things. It's actually, there's actually a moral duty to prepare people through education to undertake their place within society. And currently, and I include all of us, we are not doing that. You know, if higher education, let's just say, is the kind of the last kind of milestone on an educational journey from kind of nursery to primary to secondary to further to higher, then we are failing students by not preparing them, white and black students, because it benefits white students to also know about different types of histories in terms of trying to make them worldly people. And in terms of trying to make students of colour worldly people, it benefits them to understand their own histories and the impact that that has had on their socialisation, their belonging and how things have operated, particularly in a UK context, within the last, you know, 300 to 400 years. You know, and if we go through particular decades and if we kind of engage in those ways. And I think one of the most important things is having the confidence to talk about those kind of contexts. It's not a quick fix solution, but one of the ways in which you can do that is to diversify teaching spaces. Who do you have delivering certain types of knowledge? Who are the people that are the gatekeepers to knowledge? And what we do know, statistically speaking, is that at 8.3% BAME staff across the sector, it isn't people of colour that are the gatekeepers to knowledge. Now, I'm not saying that if you made that a 50-50 split, that that might necessarily change. It's, it's a bit presumptuous for me to suggest that. But what I would say is that increasing certain things or changing how we deliver knowledge and who delivers knowledge in particular spaces has quite a big impact on people. It's no different, for example, to having, you know, a... If we think about the types of individuals that occupy these spaces historically, they do tend to be white middle-class men. And if you have, for example, a woman occupying that space and I don't I use the word occupying to kind of suggest that these are spaces that we occupy it doesn't belong to anyone you know you it's almost like you're a gatekeeper and then you pass it on and then people add knowledge to that um, place that we're keeping it's always been the same thing the white middle class male that occupies the kind of canon's knowledge and disseminates the knowledge which okay that may work for some but having a woman in that space provides a different perspective it decenters that narrative. Having a person of colour decenters that narrative. Having somebody that may have a visible or non-visible disability decenters that narrative. Having someone from a different class background, different religious background, different back in terms of sexuality, different back. It decenters all of those kind of canons in terms of those kind of binaries in terms of this is who does this, and these are the people that occupy this space, because. You know, the great thing with an intersectional approach is that it does cater to all people within society, generally speaking. And the, con the contradictory aspect of it is that in universities, we don't have people that reflect all parts of our society. And while I'm not suggesting it's an easy problem to solve, I also wouldn't say it's the most difficult problem to solve. You know, you can diversify staff, you can diversify student bodies. There's lots of interventions you can have in place, but there has to be an intrinsic motivation to want to do that. And I would argue that one of the things about the centrality of whiteness is that sometimes there isn't that appetite to do that because the truth is people do stand to lose capital gained um, or they may say earned by maybe giving up that kind of privilege. But in terms of trying to create an equal space, it is essential that we think in those terms. Okay.
So one thing that I think is really important is this idea of kind of systemic racism and stereotypes against ethnic minority groups. I think when you don't have, pedagogically speaking, people um, who are from those backgrounds in those spaces, I do think that there is license to misconstrue particular dynamics and concepts. So for example, I may talk about gender inequality, but actually as a black male that now resides in a privileged position, there are a lot of things that I'm not going to be able to relate to. So I may be able to speak about them, but unless I declare absolute modesty, which I always do when I talk about issues that I'm not, you know, I, I understand them, but I've not experienced them, there is license to get things wrong. There is license to miscommunicate. There is license to kind of pick up different discourses that may not be actually 1000% accurate. And I think when you're doing this, of course you can't be absolutely accurate, but you need to be able to speak to a lived experience and understand it, if anything else. And I think the way systemic racism works in these stereotypes, unconsciously, and I would always like to give people the benefit of the doubt, I do think it consciously happens, but let's just say for the benefit of this discussion, unconsciously, I do think that you know, ethnic minority groups are stereotyped in particular ways. Now I could give a thousand examples of how I've seen that in classroom spaces. But I don't think I need to do that because we know that it happens. You know, ethnic minorities are presented in particular ways. You know, if we think about how they're presented through the media, and if we think that we use the media as a canon or as an instrument to facilitate some of the dialogue we have in, in classroom discussions, in terms of particularly in seminars, we know that some of these stereotypes can sometimes become the leading discourse, particularly if students construct some of their own ideas and then those ideas are funneled through a facilitator or an educator or an academic who may have particular views on certain things. Um, and while they may believe they are, they are engaging from an objective disposition, in many cases that doesn't happen. And if it didn't, we wouldn't have situations where you have these continuous stereotypes around ethnic minority groups. In terms of kind of the traction that's kind of gaining in terms of thinking about these different, um, I guess, pedagogical methodologies, um, nationally speaking, what we are seeing is this critical mass of kind of scholars of colour and um, white ally uh, scholars as well, engaging in thinking about how our education within the academy reproduces kind of racism. And I think that's quite an important thing to think about in terms of this idea of how does it reproduce it? Because you know, the overt thing would be for a lot of people to say, well, it doesn't, it's a really inclusive curriculum. But actually, it's that word inclusion again. How do people monopolize or weaponize the word inclusion? Because when you're talking about inclusion, is inclusion saying, I've opened a door and everyone can come in and I never close a door on a person that wanted to come in? You know, in the, in the technical aspect of the word, you could say that person's being inclusive by keeping their door open. Um, but actually, what, what does it mean? You know, what does it mean? Having the right to be in a space doesn't mean you occupy any kind of right, if that makes any sense. So you may have the right to be in a space because you're paying a subscription to be here. So you're here, fine. But actually, if you're in that classroom space and you don't feel like you can speak, you can talk, the curriculum doesn't reflect your lived experiences or you want to learn about your lived experience and you can't because of the curriculum on offer, then actually you don't have a right to be there. There is no right because you're there, sat in silence, absorbing information that effectively becomes hard for one to relate to. So I think in terms of kind of sustaining some of these misinterpretations of black, Asian and ethnic minority individuals, one of the things that's kind of really important is how, I guess how individuals in the academy from a pedagogical point of view, how we can challenge some of their own views. Because we do know that there are academics that have particular views on particular Minor, ra you know, racial minority groups and they have and those views I would argue very often are not separated from what they discuss in the classroom space and that has huge implications for the students that absolve that information and then take those views or construct those views as part of their worldview and then go into the real world or the world of work or society with those views and that's why in many cases you can, you can reproduce the same type of person, the same type of 
I don't want to say xenophobe, but the same type of ignorance, you can reproduce it over and over and over again because you don't have anyone in many ways breaking the chain. You don't have anyone dismantling that and you only have one particular type of individual offering one particular type of knowledge that situates one particular group of people as dom more dominant than another group of people. And that is problematic. And even if we looked at it, just if you, from a race perspective, that's one construct. But if we looked at it from an intersectional perspective, there's always that positioning of, you know, somebody is higher or we are better than. And if that kind of reverberates in a classroom for three years, that becomes the thing that you leave with. That's not to say students don't have the intelligence to discern the difference. It's to say that actually if you've, if you have an assignment and the assignment is built around a particular question and part of answering that question is to absolve this knowledge and to kind of, I guess, regurgitate it in a particular way, one of the things that, you know, you're going to be asked to do is to regurgitate that knowledge and put it in this kind of format that you're able to kind of understand. And in, in, in doing so, you will inherently, yes, you'll produce answers for an exam or an essay but it's knowledge you're taking in that in some way in some way you may not take all of it but some of it you will use to engage with in the real world or in real world discussions because your knowledge may be framed by what you're learning at that particular point in time and I think there is a responsibility by educators to kind of really think about those things. It's one of the things that I think is really important is kind of considering all the kind of different aspects around these types of things. And I think canons of knowledge are really, really important. So what type of knowledge do we want to see in our academy? You know, and I think it's a really important discussion to have. So I suppose one of the things that I would, it's really important to kind of commend the work that UCL have been doing around this area internally and other institutions as well. But one of the things that I think is really important is to kind of keep having conversations around what, who are the gatekeepers to knowledge? You know, there has to be an acknowledgement that actually that space is occupied by a certain group of people. And there has to be a willingness to engage that what has been happening hasn't worked. It's not inclusive. It's in, if inclusion goes through different kind of re, reincarnations of the word, you know, in, what inclusion means now is different from what inclusion meant 10 years ago. And what inclusion meant 10 years ago is different from what inclusion meant 20 years ago. There has to be an acknowledgement that we have to keep reconceptualizing what that term means. And in doing so, we need to think about the people who are the gatekeepers to knowledge. And are they, as custodians, as custodians of that space, are they representing a knowledge that is reflective of the multicultural, ethnic multicultural society that we live in? Does the literature reflect that? Does the information on the board reflect that? Does the learning space reflect that? You know, something as simple as visual aids, do all, do all of these things impact that? Do they affect those things? And I think that's a conversation we need to kind of continue to have. I think engaging with BAME students to incorporate their histories is really, really important. I think one of the things that becomes really central to these histories is the absence of the, that history and the historical amnesia that ensues when we talk about the empire, as an example. So we talk about the empire in a particular way, and it completely omits all of the atrocities of its colonial past. Um, and that is very uncomfortable for the BAME student that has to sit there and listen to how great Great Britain is without acknowledging the oppression that it basically placed on, in many respects, those students' ancestors over a sustained and prolonged period of time. So that is something that becomes really, really important because that incorporating of histories becomes essential in making people feel as though my presence, my body, my, my whole being is acknowledged in that space. Not having that history marginalises people. It keeps BAME students and staff on the periphery. It keeps them on the periphery, on the outside, always looking in. And to kind of disrupt that, what we do need are white allies that think about things, that continue to think about things, and I use the term white allies because we do have some fantastic white allies in the sector, to think about things in a way that continues to disrupt these spaces because 
I'll always say you've, the thing that I always find really interesting is that I, I've never met a black, Asian or minority ethnic person that asked to experience racism, but they're always in a position where they're asked to absolve, to relieve themselves from it. You know, they're asked to deal with the issue. They're asked to kind of find a way of kind of coming to terms with this. And that becomes quite impactful. In terms of marginalization, exclusion in the learning environment, I think one of the things that's really important is, as I said, you know, looking at what that looks like, you know, um, and I also would call for staff, generally speaking, from all particular backgrounds to make a conscious effort to put themselves in uncomfortable spaces. I think when you place yourself in uncomfortable learning spaces, whether that might be through a conference or internal conferences or internal kind of training, by doing that, you can then gain some experience of what it feels like maybe, not necessarily to be marginalised or excluded from knowledge, but to be on the periphery of something, to be on the outside looking in. And I think in doing that kind of reflection, that also helps individuals to kind of think about what they may do in the learning space. I think the idea of co-constructing knowledge is really, really important. And I think working with students, particularly students of colour, to co-construct what would an inclusive curriculum look like is really powerful. Because what we do know is that in terms of curriculum design, students of colour very rarely have much engagement with that. Very rarely are their opinions asked in terms of what do you think could work better in a curriculum. Module feedback, module reviews is not the same thing. It's not the same thing. And actually often um, what we do know is a lot of BAME students don't feel like they can actually answer coherently with that because the questions are structured in a way which actually doesn't really find out about whether they enjoyed that learning experience and the truth is they wouldn't enjoy that learning experience. And if they reside as one or two or three people of colour in the group, it's going to be quite obvious if they put down particular responses, even though they're anonymised, who those responses came from. So I think that's really, really important. And I think the last point, which is a really kind of good way of a, a framework of thinking by Professor Zeus Leonardo at the University of California, are these ideas around the apartheid of knowledge. So how we separate knowledge. So... A good example of how we separate knowledge would be something like Black History Month. You know, there's a real focus on that history in the month of October in the UK. But throughout the rest of the year, that apartheid of knowledge means that we only learn about, you know, particular canons of knowledge. The dominant one being dominant white Eurocentric knowledge. And then when we get to kind of that particular part of the month, we run lots of different workshops to engage, you know, black, Asian, minority ethnic communities which actually is quite futile. So it's finding it's futile because it lasts for four weeks and an academic year, as far as I'm aware, is about eight months. So there is an obvious need to bridge the chasm between that apartheid of knowledge, which becomes really important. I think considering unconscious bias training becomes a really important part of this. I think for me, one of the interesting things is we all hold unconscious biases. I hold them, we all do. Um, but I think one of the things that is kind of really interesting is that unconscious bias kind of continues to remain the acceptable face of racism. Um, it's a difficult thing because a lot of people don't like this engaging with it, they find it problematic. But fundamentally, unconscious bias draining, it demonstrates that universities have good faith and a willingness to address racism, which is great. But actually, it needs to move beyond that. Okay, so in terms of those unconscious biases, that's one thing. But actually, what we want to kind of unpack is, why do people think about things in a particular way? And it does mean having open discussions about difficult issues, particularly around talking about racism in the learning space. Why do people find it so difficult? You know, if we work off the premise that, you know, the perception is that these are highly educated intelligent individuals, if we work off that premise, I mean, that doesn't equate to common sense, but if, if, if we work off that premise, then the premise would be that as experienced educators, and in many cases, constructors of knowledge, if they specialize in a particular area, we should be able to develop a, learn, a pedagogical learning space where people are able to take, where people are able to feel like they can take from that, in, that kind of pedagogy, that kind of curriculum, but for whatever reason, there are things that are stopping that. So I think there are biases that we all hold that stop us from doing it. So for example, on a personal note, if I talk about things around class, my unconscious bias might be that being from a 
working class background, that influences a lot of my thinking. But as a continuous stream of thought, I'm quite conscious of that. And I'm also conscious that that could affect the way I hear different experiences that may not be aligned to being a working class person. In other words, if someone was from a middle class background, I know that the unconscious biases I may have around particular people from middle class backgrounds may impair my thinking. But it's a conversation that I'm very mindful, it's a, it's a consequence that I'm very mindful of, and so I openly talk about it. I talk about it to try and learn where I can kind of dismantle some of that unconscious bias. And that's, and I think positionality is a really important thing. So I would always work from the premise of myself first before I'd encourage anyone to consider thinking about how they may do something. But, you know, growing up on a council estate in absolute poverty, you're going to have a particular perception of middle class people who have wealth. Um, but in a learning space, in terms of trying to make everyone feel included, I have to be able to have that perception challenged by staff, students, colleagues. And part of that means I have to have difficult conversations with people. And it's something that I would encourage all of us to do. And I use myself as an example in that context because it's the one thing that I think people always kind of, everyone always has an opinion on class. They always have an opinion on gender. In many respects, they always have an opinion on sexuality and disability and religion. On race, it's, all, it's kind of quite difficult. You know, people always feel like potentially they could say something that could offend someone racially and there's all of those kind of different things around it. But I think it's important that we have those conversations because how it's playing out in our classroom spaces is through things like the awarding gap, through things like BAME students feeling like, well, actually when I go there, I don't learn anything about myself. I feel excluded from that space. I'm just not going to attend. And that all funnels into the awarding gap because to be able to achieve, you have to be present and, you know, Somebody could be in class or be in that learning space, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're present. Because if what they're seeing on the board basically denigrates their legacy of people, or it doesn't actually represent anything about themselves, which you know, we do come to a learning spaces to learn about ourselves, then for a lot of people, there's not gonna be any point in them being around. And it's very hard to argue against that. Can okay, move on from this. I think in terms of kind of centering discussions about race and racism within the curricula, we kind of spoke about the reluctance to engage, but I think openness from staff becomes the really important thing. So do staff, can we create environments as practitioners, professional staff, academics, where we have an openness around some of these discussions? It means staff will have to have their opinion challenged in a way that perhaps students are not able to do because of how the hierarchies work. Now, I would argue that a good pedagogue allows, removes hierarchy in the learning space and allows students to engage with them on the same level. You don't work from the premise of, I, I'm here and the student's here, which we do know a lot of academics do work from that premise. And it's not to generalize, but it is this idea that, you know, if you're talking about an area that you've studied for, let's just say, seven years through PhD, you would be the expert on that area. But it can also create a reluctance to engage in different perspectives and opinions, particularly from younger, younger people. So I think there has to be an openness from staff and there has to be kind of a reciprocacy that allows students to challenge some of those views. But in an open space, and I wouldn't even recommend a learning space for that, I would actually recommend a fora. So I'd recommend a forum that allows staff to basically sit with students and for students, all students across the intersection, but in this case we're talking about students of colour because we're talking about race and racism, to kind of talk about, okay, what are some of the things you would like to see staff talk about in those learning spaces? What would that look like? If you could create a learning space, how might you engage in that dialogue with staff? How might we eliminate that hierarchy? You know, because the reality is there will be some students who can speak better to that experience than some staff are. And the only thing that separates them in position is maybe title or qualifications. But actually there'll be some students who can speak better to that. So how do we find a way to embrace and embody that knowledge and to disseminate it in a way that eliminates hierarchy and ego and makes everybody a part of that space? And I think that's really, really integral. In terms of optimising change, I'm just going to focus on one point here, which I do think is a really, really, two points, which I do think is an important uh, point. 
I think the aspect around collective responsibility, as I mentioned earlier, is really, really important. I think for too long, for many decades, the onus on dismantling racism within higher education has fell on the laps of women of colour, who don't ask for that, but they themselves are not remunerated, supported, um, there is no pre career progression in doing this activity. The motivation is purely intrinsic. And there are men of colour, some do this work, a lot have benefited from the labour of women of colour doing this work, and that has been problematic. Um, and I think there's an onus on not just white allies to engage with this discourse, but also men of colour to work more closely with women of colour and alleviate that burden, because that burden has fallen to women of colour and you know, we can see it through particular canons you know, or particular kind of examples. If we even think of how many, for example, black female professors there are, um, if we think about some of these kind of different aspects in terms of promotion to senior uh, management levels, we know that women of colour are significantly affected by these con contexts. And we also know it happens because a lot of the time they're carrying a burden that they shouldn't be doing on their own. So I think it's really important that idea of collective responsibility. In terms of the second point from here, I think it is, it's not a quick fix, it's not a quick fix, but it is something that would make life a lot easier. If academic teaching staff and professional staff were more diversified, I think that could have a huge implication for what happens in the classroom space. Because I think that you cannot separate life experience and lived experience from the classroom. Now, if you have a predominantly one type of lived experience, which might be that of a white middle class male, that becomes a dominant experience for all students and they don't have a say in that. When you diversify an academic teaching space, you have lots of different experiences that provide different viewpoints on how to experience life and how to experience different things. And again, in terms of this toolkit we talk about in terms of preparing people to go into the world of work, the world society generally speaking, that is essential. To have different types of people engage with you through different types of intersections. That has a huge, huge implication on the world view that a student has when they enter university and when they leave university. And I think that is integral. But I think one of the things that's kind of really important is these ideas around kind of the disparities in attainment. Why is it happening? Um, yes, the obvious comparison to draw is between BAME and white students at UCL, but in terms of the, dispar the disparity, one of the things that's kind of really important to acknowledge is that a lot of these BAME students come into UCL with high tariffs in the first place because UCL asks for high tariffs in terms of being able to study here. So if they're coming out of here and they're not achieving what they should be achieving. The go-to is always that it's because the students are not capable. Those BME students are not as capable as those white students. They're coming on the same tariff. So there's something institutionally that's happened or happening in our institutions across the sector, not singling out UCL, that needs to change to, to mobilize those students to fulfill their full potential. Um, I like music, I like music a lot, and um, one of my favourite songs is a song called I Am The Walrus by The Beatles. And the opening sneer from that song um, talks about this idea of being together and being in it together. One of the kind of central things I've spoken about today is this idea of kind of collective responsibility. And I think one of the things that I am always kind of concerned with is who historically is taking up that responsibility. And as I've kind of mentioned, it's always been women of colour. I think it's really, really important that we begin to think about these educational spaces as our spaces. Um, when they go great, it seems to belong to everyone. When they go not so well, then it's like, it's not my problem. And then it's the same group of people who take up the charge, women of colour, to change those racialized problems. And I think we all need to collectively engage. I mean, th the irony isn't lost on me now that we're in a room full of uh, women, so that, that, that irony itself is it lost, is it lost on me. But I, one of the things that I'm, and yeah, and so it, it, it's, it's, it's funny, but it isn't funny. I mean, sometimes I laugh about it because I would cry if, if I was actually 
if I didn't add just to it, you would cry because it is sad to see. But I do think there needs to be a, collect a collectivity in terms of we all need to have a collegiality where we work to kind of disseminate the knowledge we know to work with particular types of stakeholders and really to have open discussions around this that relieve women of colour of that burden and more importantly, that allow us all to take responsibility for what fundamentally is our academy. It's not, it doesn't belong to any group of people, it's our academy. And, you know, I would always say that education or university is a microcosm of society. You know, it's a microcosm of society and it, it prides itself on that. Universities will always say, we are a microcosm of society, we reflect society. Well, the society that I know and that we all know is quite multicultural and that isn't what is happening amongst our staff, our learning spaces and the knowledges that we learn. So I think there's a collective responsibility for all of us to change that because it's not just BAME students that benefit or staff that benefit from a more inclusive academy, it's all of us in being able to navigate a multicultural society. Um, just want to say like it's never really lost on me how lucky I am to be able to do these things. Um, it's an absolute privilege. I I'm very, very grateful to all of you for taking the time to be here today. I know uh, it's a bit derelict today, but like, thank you so, so much. I said this before, I was fortunate to do a keynote here in 2018. And one of the things that I said is that when UCL does something, the world takes note. So UCL really is in a position to do something where the sector will take lead. And that is, I guess, if there's a plus to being UCL, that is a huge plus, is that when UCL does all of those types of institutions, when they take the lead on something, then lots of institutions will follow. Um, and if we're talking about the Russell Group context, then that's in particular, because what we do know is that in the post-92s, they have done a lot of work around this, and they've been quicker to act to it than perhaps the, post, than perhaps the Russell Group institutions. But what we are seeing is movement, and I think that in this particular context, um, yeah, thank you for having me, I really appreciate it.